You're too restless, too restless writing books, too restless launching European movements with Yanis Varoufakis. I think we keep you on two feet, otherwise you're going to launch a couple more things just tonight. And instead we need to launch just one thing, which is the transparency campaign that DiEM is going to begin its campaigning career with. But first, let's go help me out. Transparency is a word that is not always very clear. One minute, what is transparency? <laughs> This is not really, I mean, transparent to say it in one minute, uh, but let's try. Uh, let me start with a picture about the world in which we live today. It is a world which was described even before Olds Huxley and George Orwell, the famous dystopian uh, science fiction novels. In 1921, you have a novel which is called We, by a Russian novelist who is called Evgeny Zamyatin. And he imagines a world where all the houses of the people who live in the world, the walls are out of glass and everything is transparent. They have only one hour per day to have sex, except there is one, one condition, they have to register the time for the sex and the partner for the sex. This was the first novel in the Soviet empire which was censored even 10 years before the Stalinist purge started. And I think we live in such a world today already except that we don't even have this one hour of privacy anymore. Big companies from Google, Microsoft and so on succeeded to bring us into our surveillance society. So what we can see on the one hand is that all our lives are completely transparent, but on the other hand, the decisions about our lives are not transparent. Let me give you just two short examples which will bring us into the campaign and into the reason why this is the first campaign of DiEM. That's my and next question, of, Zesko, so don't, okay, but let don't me steal give my you just, questions. Let me give you just two examples. You didn't give me a chance to sit down, so I'm sorry. First example, several weeks ago, the Euro European Council met in Brussels, and they were discussing, among other things, the UK referendum and the refugee crisis. Did we follow it? Did we have a live stream on that? No. But you see what's happening with the refugee crisis today. Second example, Mr. Yanker said, we have nothing to hide. However, on the other hand, the biggest secret agreement in recent human history, the triumvirate of three secret agreements, TTIP, TISA, and TPP, is being negotiated behind closed doors. 52 states will form a new economic bloc, which Hillary Clinton, probably the next president of the US, called the economic NATO. These secret agreements will completely change our daily lives, from internet to intellectual property, medicine, corporations we have, will have the opportunity to sue countries such as Italy, Croatia, and so on. And we didn't have any chance to see the secret agreements. Only thanks to WikiLeaks, and to someone who will be soon here, this is Julian Assange, we had a glance into these secret agreements. And let me just end, because I think we have to speak about Brussels today here. First, yes, we have to condemn terrorism everywhere. But there are two things which will happen after Brussels, I think. The first thing is, our lives will become even more transparent and the second, I think what we can expect in the European Union in the months to follow is something what happened after 9-11 in US, and this is the Patriot Act. I think what we will have in Europe is a new Patriot Act on European level. And it is not by chance that after Paris, Paris was the first moment, after Paris, the former boss of CIA said that people such as Edward Snowden, people such as Julian Assange have blood on their hands. Why do they have blood on their hands? because they were the people who were revealing the secret agreements. They were the ones who were revealing the secrets of the centers of power, and those people now are in Moscow or in the Ecuadorian embassy for four years. Is this the future society where we want to live in? I think no, and this is the, one of the reasons why DiEM is starting the campaign. Thank you, thank you, Zdrachko. And on the theme of TTIP, I think we've got uh, Katya telling us 
sells, telling us something. Katya Kipping was on the stage in Berlin on the 9th of February. She was one of the people who, at the very beginning, uh, expressed her, in, her enthusiasm uh, to join and support Diem and to take it forward. And here is Katya for you. Liebe Freundinnen und Freunde von Diem25, ich sende euch hiermit solidarische Grüße aus Berlin. Ich habe gehört, wir planen eine Initiative für mehr Transparenz. Das begrüße ich ausdrücklich, gerade mit Blick auf die TTIP-Dokumente. In Berlin gibt es ja jetzt einen Leseraum für Abgeordnete für die Dokumente des TTIP. Und als ich da rein wollte, musste ich unterschreiben, dass ich nichts sage über das, was ich dort lese. Ich habe mich gefragt, Wer hat eigentlich diese Verhandlungsgruppen von Seiten der EU und der USA legitimiert? Ich erinnere mich an keiner Wahl, wo man ihnen das Recht gegeben hat, über unsere Köpfe hinweg zu entscheiden. Nun musste ich unterschreiben, nichts zu sagen, was ich gelesen habe, also kann ich nur darüber sprechen, was ich nicht gelesen habe. Ich habe in diesem TTIP-Leseraum keinen Vorschlag für mehr Verbraucherschutz gelesen. Ich habe keinen Vorschlag für einen besseren Schutz von Beschäftigten gelesen und keinen Vorschlag für mehr Umweltschutz oder mehr Demokratie gelesen. Die Geheimniskrämerei ist entlarvend. Denn wer vorhat, ein Abkommen für mehr Demokratie, mehr Verbraucherschutz, mehr Umweltschutz zu treffen, der muss das Licht der Öffentlichkeit eben nicht scheuen. Insofern haben mich meine Erfahrungen im TTIP-Leseraum darin bestärkt, Abkommen wie das TTIP und wie CETA sind zu stoppen und es braucht Transparenz. Democracy needs transparency. Let's fight for it. Julian. Come diceva, parlando di TTIP. As uh, somebody said, uh, talking about TTIP, uh, if there was no need to keep it secret, they wouldn't keep it secret. So it's true and correct what Katya said. Why do we need to keep secret all the documents pertaining to TTIP? So, uh, and this <laughs> Julian is... Julian the same in Berlin and so on. But Zrechko, uh, to build up on what Katya was saying, while we, while we wait for the connection with Julian to be established, as you can imagine, it is uh, not the most straightforward Skype call to make. Why do you think that uh, negotiations with TTIP are being kept secret? Why? Mm. I think what is happening with TTIP is something which should worry all of us. What they are trying to do is that, I mean, if you take into, con into consideration the bigger geopolitical picture, what U.S. is trying to do, they were always fighting about against Euro-Asian integration. So the problem is that China and Russia are already cooperating on two, two fields. The first field is the new Silk Road, which will make the possibility po realistic and possible that cheap Chinese goods will come from Beijing to Hamburg in two or three days. And the second one is energetic deals. So this is the biggest fear of the US, and this is the reason why US is now trying to integrate the European Union in something which Hillary Clinton calls the new economic NATO. And I think this should worry us, not only because there is no transparency, but because the institutions of the European Union are not functioning. So when the European Council, when the European Parliament met several weeks ago, they got an agreement between the European Commission and the US and the lobbies from the biggest corporations in the world. And you know, the situation was that the European Parliament, only, the only thing they have to do and they can do is to agree on something which was already agreed. So what TTIP shows is a perfect example that the democratic institutions of Europe are not functioning. And uh, while we wait for the connection with Julian to be established, let's get a bit ahead of ourselves. Diem is launching its first campaign on transparency. And after Assange, we will see exactly how it's going to work and we will invite everyone to start signing this petition. But tell us a little bit more what's in this petition. What is it that Diem is going to be asking for concretely through it? So we have several main requests. One of the main requests is that all meetings of the Eurogroup, of ECOFIN, 
end of the European Council will be live streamed. Today on television you can watch the Big Brother and it's live streamed. Today on tele, but you know, is Big Brother so important for our daily lives? Today you can even see this. It's live streamed. It is, such, is it such a big problem to have a live streaming today in the 21st century? Our second demand is that all these meetings, including the meetings of the European Central Bank, have transcripts released several weeks after the meetings, and then also minutes before the transcripts. Our next request is that we have a register of more than 10,000 lobbyists in Brussels who are deciding our lives. And our third request is that immediately all the parts of TTIP will be public. And I invite you all to join it, and we will explain it later how you can join. Can I get an update on the connection with Julian? <laughs> Shall I see what's happening? Ah, he's coming. Hi. Julian! Hello. Julian, good evening and welcome here. It is extraordinarily... Firstly, we don't hear you. We need to fix the sound. While we try to raise the sound, I should say, speaking about TTIP, that the only reason why we know something about the negotiations of TTIP is because of the documents that WikiLeaks provided us with. Julian. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, perfectly. Aha. Well, I, I was last in Rome in 2009. Uh, but alas, have not had the opportunity to be there since. But uh, I suppose this is the next best thing. Uh, some sort of dystopian future that uh, if we don't do our jobs right, we might all end up in. Julian, um, tell us why you're behind this campaign on transparency and tell us why this is the issue to begin a movement for democracy with. And then I will leave you to exchange a couple of words with Zrechko, who has had the great chance of, uh, of bringing you close to us. Great chance, the great uh, honor. honor. And, fun. and fun. Well, look, let's understand uh, what the basics of democracy is. Uh, it's all of us together collectively sharing our knowledge about our environment and our will uh, to change it in particular ways uh, and to oppose change in other ways. Uh, now that requires knowledge of what the circumstance we find ourselves in and it requires an ability to communicate with each other. So uh, the transparency of our environment uh, is coupled together with freedom of expression in a very uh, close relationship. Uh, they are mirror images of each other uh, and we value them uh, not because we're concerned with boring process words uh, like transparency, uh, but because it is what makes us human uh, to understand our environment, uh, to share that understanding, uh, and to uh, develop a will together to make a better environment. The problem we're seeing in Europe right now uh, is uh, there is a decreasing uh, political will for the European Union to exist at all. So presently, the European Union is doomed. Uh, it has got to either transform, uh, democratize, uh, or it will uh, dissolve entirely. And that would be a, a great shame for Europe. It will bring, in fact, uh, possibly quite serious uh, poverty and uh, calamity on some parts of Europe, but it is a, <coughs> a significant problem for other people in the world. Uh, presently, if we look at states in Africa, what are their choices? They can choose to deal with, broadly speaking, uh, the United States uh, as a uh, legal and geopolitical and trade entity, or they can choose to deal with China. Uh, 
Uh, now, there's other players as well, but they exist in the gaps uh, between these two. That's not enough of a choice for people around the world. Uh, in the post-war period, Europe uh, established at an ideological level some things that we find to be valuable, concern for each other, how to resolve disputes and conflicts. And yes, of course, they took place uh, under the umbrella of NATO and in a post-war period and to some extent uh, were artificial. I think these are very important things uh, to be held on to. And if we're not able to generate the correct political will to do so, uh, they will simply disappear and we'll be left with only big power politics. <coughs> now, why is the will for the European Union to exist uh, in a state of collapse? It is because there is a fundamental democratic deficit in the European Union. That deficit arises in two places. Number one, it arises from a failure to be transparent. How can people support or oppose what key power institutions in the European Union are doing uh, if their activities and how they come to their decisions uh, is opaque? People cannot choose to support it. Uh, and then secondly, uh, even if the European Union in areas uh, gains more transparency, uh, how, is the political, how does the political feedback operate? Is there um, mechanisms uh, for, pe for, European, for peoples across Europe uh, to express their support uh, or opposition uh, to what is going on? Now, everyone can see by the decisions of the European Union, uh, by its failure uh, to deal with the Eurozone crisis, uh, by its failure uh, to deal with uh, terrorism within Europe, uh, by its failure to uh, fairly and in a unified manner uh, deal with the problems of migration. Uh, the, the European Union is not acting to address the concerns of people in Europe. So, uh, of course, that results in decreasing political will for the existence of the European Union. Uh, now, we're seeing that in many different ways. On the left, uh, on the in the populist right, uh, even to some degree uh, amongst certain establishments uh, that exist, for example, in the United Kingdom. If European Union can't be transparent uh, and responsive to the democratic concerns of its people, it loses political will and <coughs> it simply loses the ability to act. Uh, now, I want to go back to Brussels. Um, now I had family uh, in Paris. Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, Islamic terrorism and some other forms of terrorism uh, our reality to a small amount of people from time to time in Europe, but it could grow larger. Uh, parasitizing on the back of that uh, is a security response, and Preco is absolutely right that we can expect, and we have already seen at, at a national level uh, in the United Kingdom uh, and in France, uh, European versions of the Patriot Act uh, that will fundamentally undermine those things which make Europe as an ideological construct, something that is worth supporting. Now, that didn't come from nowhere. Uh, it came, Islamic terrorism in Europe didn't came, come from nowhere. It came as a result of fundamental weaknesses in the unity and coherence of the European Union, which permitted individual member states to engage <coughs> in crazed adventurism uh, in the Middle East, for a variety of reasons. Unilateral adventurism. So yes, the United Kingdom uh, was a central component of that with the United States, uh, but also France, uh, also Italy. Uh, now, we've just recently released uh, uh, 32,000 of Hillary Clinton's emails, and you can read all about um, the UK and France's and the Italian energy company ENI's uh, involvement in Libya where it says nakedly that uh, Cameron uh, and Sarkozy, uh, in exchange for their part in the war against Libya, uh, wanted more than 35% uh, of Libya's oil. That is not something that the majority of European citizens would support, a war for oil. 
Uh, they wouldn't support it because most people are decent people. Uh, they wouldn't support it because some people understand that if you bring war and terrorism uh, to another country, war and terrorism can come back to you. The sorts of terrorist attacks that we saw in Paris, uh, that we saw in Brussels, similar death counts caused by terrorism, uh, caused by Western arms and bombs, uh, have been suffered by the peoples of Iraq, Syria, uh, and Libya uh, since 2003. That kind of violence happening almost every day. Uh, so you can imagine um, the changes in the structures to those societies, uh, having the, that kind of suffering to them. Uh, that has produced not only, that, ha that has provided uh, fuel for the construct construction of a political and ideological swamp filled with hatred and revenge, uh, and Europe is suffering the consequences as a result. So I think we um, must understand that when the European Union lacks coherence in relation to its foreign policy concerns, when individual member states effectively run off uh, with US geopolitical ambitions, the result is terrorism within Europe, the result is mass migration flows within Europe. Uh, it was obvious that this was going to happen. Uh, I was speaking about this and many others at the time that it was happening uh, <coughs> in 2011 uh, and beyond, and many people uh, on the left and some uh, on the popular right were speaking about it at the time uh, of the Iraq war. This uh, strategic blunder uh, from a European perspective would come to haunt Europe, and it has. Um, okay, so uh, going on to another major uh, strategic blunder. Uh, yes, it is unfair. Uh, yes, it is unjust and ideological, but more than that, uh, it is something that is not even within, even um, beneficial uh, to uh, much of the ruling classes, I think, ultimately in Europe, and that is entering into the TTIP in the way that it is presently constructed. <coughs> uh, the United States, seeing the rise of China, uh, understands that it uh, may lose some dominance uh, in the South Pacific uh, and in Eurasia. It has been concerned for a very long time about the uh, possible integration of Eurasia. Uh, the United States, as, as a strategic concept, uh, is an integrated landmass, uh, one currency, uh, one language, uh, one people from a sort of white Christian perspective. Um, and as a result, it is a natural superpower. The only uh, possible rivals for that uh, <coughs> are the European Union and China and the integration of Eurasia. So let's, let's look at it. Why does Europe not have a foreign policy that can project uh, the best of its values, making agreements with people, uh, enforcing genuine human rights? Uh, Europe has, the European Union has 508 million people. It has a GDP significantly larger than the United States and significantly larger than China. Uh, why is it always in a position uh, where it is uh, following uh, the US lead? It is, it is in a position where it can do much better for itself and for the rest of the world. The uh, TTIP is part of three agreements which have geopolitical ambitions to ring China. Uh, that's the TPP, which involves the US and Asian states, uh, the TISA, which involves 52 states, uh, and the transatlantic agreement between the United States and Europe, the TTIP. Uh, that's more than two thirds of uh, global GDP bound up in these agreements. Uh, now, that puts Europe on a, that, constructs a new economic, legal, and to a degree military block uh, to face off 
with China. Is that something uh, that the people have, Europe, have all bought into? The construction, as Hillary Clinton says, of a new economic NATO, or as Defence Secretary Ashton Carter said uh, late last year, uh, a, uh, a new aircraft carrier uh, for the uh, engagement uh, in the Asia Pacific. I don't think that that's something uh, that the European people agree to, and the uh, form in which it's proposed, it is not something they can agree to because there is no transparency in it. Uh, so, <coughs> GM has uh, produ produced uh, a demand of the uh, Commission, uh, which is on the, or should shortly be, uh, on the website. And I want to uh, briefly go through that uh, demand. Julian, I need to ask you one minute uh, to wrap minute. this up. Okay. okay. Um, That's the nasty job I've got here, Julian. Please yeah, sympathize yeah, I know, with I know. me. Uh, the TTIP is not a mere trade treaty, but a new economic and legal order which creates permanent obligations on the member states to dramatically alter their own laws. Uh, the TTIP draws within its ambit laws governing labour, work conditions, health and safety, food safety, transportation, infrastructure, postal services, <coughs> wildlife, environmental protections, intellectual property, which is everything that we do over the internet, uh, data governance and financial services regulation. So this is an ideological project which restructures the economic and legal basis for all people within the European Union. It locks it in in the form of a treaty. So you can forget about any kind of national level politics. Do you want more of a social democratic state uh, do you want more of an anarcho-capitalist state? Do you want uh, more of a socialist state? Uh, or any other variation? You can forget about that. Once the TTP IP is passed in the versions that are proposed, uh, those political questions are at an end. Um, so the demands are... I won't go through them all. Um, <coughs> uh, but... We're going to show the petition text uh, in uh, we'll the petition just text. one minute, okay. so you can be extremely okay. concise in giving us the bulk of them. Okay. So there's about six points. Um, first of all, <clears throat> the release of the texts as they're negotiated after each round. This is done with other serious agreements, uh, not small ones, but other serious agreements. It is done the rest of the world, and it can be done with the TGIP. An immediate end to DG trade, uh, that's the body of the... European Commission responsible for negotiating this agreement, to engaging in politicised efforts to promote the TTIP before the text is even finalised. It's not the Commission's role to be promoting the agreement to a, a trade uh, agreement where we don't even know what it is. Uh, that's a political function. DG Trade's responsibility is to negotiate agreements, not to push and propagandise uh, the public into agreeing to them afterwards. Immediate changes to the procedure of the European Parliament uh, to give it the chance to review the chapters after each successful round of negotiation. It, at the moment, it's take it at all or leave it at all. And many genuine trade issues are ending up into the TTIP, acting as a coercive ratchet uh, to prevent uh, people from blocking it because of the other measures that are in the TTIP which many people think should be opposed. And the immediate suspension of all TTIP negotiations with the United States until it agrees to the same or closely similar standards to those proposed uh, to these demands. Why is that necessary? Well, it's a brotherly act to the people of the United States. However, there's something key for people within the European Union. The European Union has released some material not the key negotiated texts, but proposals. The United States has not. So what has been happening is the European Union has been laundering the most controversial, the most controversial proposals into the US. You make that proposal in your material because you're not making any of that public and some of ours we have to make public. That has got to come to an end. Julian, thank you so very much for being here tonight.
And if I, if I may, let me just add that I really hope that next time Julian will come to Rome very soon.